Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Gregory O'Brien. It's a huge pleasure, a delight, in fact, to be with you here today to um, have an hour-long conversation with Simon Winchester, a protean figure, a, um, a superstar of um, popular history. And I think on that, has this fallen off? <laughs> I'm just about to have, to have a bit of microphone trouble before we get going. Um, I think we're okay. Um, before we start talking, though, I'd just like to very quickly um, just thank a few people. Um, on behalf of the festival, I'd like to thank Lion Foundation, Victoria University of Wellington, Creative New Zealand, QT Museum Wellington, Unity Books, and the New Zealand Listener for their support of this event, of this um, session in particular. Now, um, I think Simon Winchester will need very little introduction. I'm just going to sketch in a few, I suppose, salient points before we start talking. He's going to read a couple of things during the session, but really it's going to be an informal discussion, and I think perhaps with about a quarter of an hour to go, we'll open the floor up to, um, to questions. Um, Simon's written, to date, some 30 books. Um, a Korean uh, fortune teller told him some years ago he'd write 38 in his life. So I guess <laughs> the thinking there is that he's got eight to go. Um, they, tr they cover incredible territory, but I guess his baseline is geology. That was what he studied at Oxford in the 19, 1960s. And um, I was reminded a little bit of the ge geology field trip today. Um, Simon, on the way walking here this morning, um, we got hit by the most extraordinary gust of wind in Simon's reading glasses. Note, no reading glasses. <laughs> seemed to disappear straight up into mid-air and were never seen again. And anyway, Simon went back to the um, hotel to get another pair. Meanwhile, Setsko, his wife, and I started looking for them. This was outside the um, New World supermarket where there were a few little bushes. A parking attendant came along and he threw himself into the... Um, well, it was becoming a geological site, is my point. <laughs> he threw himself, and then a member of the public came along, and we all started looking for these, um, these titanium reading glasses that we really needed to find, and, um, and we couldn't find them. And later on the day, I went back. I kept thinking maybe they ended up in a tree because they seemed to blow upwards. But um, I guess one of the great things about um, Simon as a writer, though, to me, he exists in two places. One is, I guess, the reading glasses, which were stripped from him today. He's a, a, a learned writer. He's a scholar. Um, a slightly non-conformist scholar, perhaps, and I think that's an interesting point. He's someone who reads, who, um, who studies the humanities and the human record of things. But he's also, I think, very much in the field of the geology field trip. He's someone that actually goes out into the elements, i.e. this morning <laughs> when the elements won, I guess. Um, and actually, um, he goes places, he travels places. And so, as many of you all know who have looked at his books, he seems to have been just about everywhere in the world. In one of his books, he mentions the fact that he's crossed the Atlantic 500 times, um, which is an extraordinary figure. <laughs> um, uh, that's frequent flying, I yes, think. Yes, a lot of miles. Right. <laughs> um, the Pacific, you know, um, and I guess this is one of the great things about his books is when you read them, he enters these books. He's actually been there. You know, he's been, he's stood on this island. He's lived in this place, you know, Hong Kong, 12 years you know, he's lived in Honolulu, he understands Polynesia, he, um, he sort of, he puts himself there bodily. Uh, so, I guess, um, to me, a lot of the writings are about a presence, it's a project that involves, I guess, his life, his being places, but also his intelligence, and also, very important, I think, his, um, his particular capabilities and capacities as a writer. And I guess perhaps that's one thing I'd like to touch on today, Simon, is, um, Simon was, um, was given an, an OBE in 2006 for services to journalism and literature. He started off, I guess, as a journalist. And I'd like to kind of look at the way the writing does cross those boundaries. What are these things different? You know, what master do you serve, kind of journalism or literature? Maybe I should even start with that question, and then we're going to talk about Pacific, his new book. But, uh, Which master do I serve? Um, I don't do an awful lot of journalism these days. I actually find it rather difficult if someone says, can you write a quick... 1,200 words on something. I much prefer what Americans are increasingly calling long-form journalism. It's a, a new phrase which has crept into the vernacular now. Things, uh, to write something at 12,000 words is relatively easy. To write something at 100,000 words is relatively easy. It just takes uh -huh. a bit of longer. But to write something concise in it's rather like you in poetry, isn't it? I mean, in a way, if you pare it down and pare it down and pare it down, it becomes, at least at my stage in life, much more difficult than it used to be. Mm. It used to be 
you know, that I'd go to some riot, let's say, in West Belfast, and it's 10 o'clock at night, and, and someone's been shot, and there's a huge explosion, and you know you're just coming up to the first edition of the paper, so you call the number in Manchester and dictate it without even writing it down, and just because it was The Guardian trying to make it, because The Guardian is a, a newspaper which, at least in those days, very much cherished good writing, and so you'd try and dictate it off the top of your head in as good a fashion as you possibly can. I always remember the difficulty, though, that the sort of the impenetrable wall were the copy takers. I mean, nowadays, of course, you send your journalism in all sorts of ways. I mean, it used to be telex, or it used to be, or, or nowadays it just goes you know, instantaneously. I mean, this book, the Pacific book, when I finished it, in the old days, you'd, you'd go and print it, and you'd wrap it up in ribbons, and you'd put it in the post, and it'd take three or four days. Now, press a button, 10 seconds later, all that work is on your mm. editor's desk. Well, it wasn't so in the old days, and, and certainly in a place like Northern Ireland, you'd be in the middle of a, a riot, and you'd be trying to encapsulate the story, doing 600 words very quickly off the top of your head, and you'd have a a copy taker over in Manchester, sitting at a silent typewriter with a cigarette in his mouth. And you say, who is it? I say, Simon Winchester, where are you? Belfast. What, what's the, the catch line? I'd say, riot. He said, no, you can't call it riot. There are so many riots in Belfast. <laughs> call it something, yeah. something else, like Shankill. And after about two minutes of dictating what you think is the purest liquid prose, he'd say, is there much more of this? <laughs> that really puts you off, I tell you. So that kind of thing, I don't do much of. And I yeah. don't, don't serve those masters very often. Right. So, I mean, with, with, the, with the books that you've done, I mean, I guess, for, for, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but since, I guess, the mid-'90s, you have been a full-time writer on books, basically. I mean, have, you, have they been commissioned by topic, or have you found your way? I mean, as you'll know, there there's the, was the book about the Atlantic that came out in 2010. Um, you've covered a, a lot of historical ground in China and... I mean, in the great oceans of the world. Um, is, this, is this because of a kind of a global curiosity on your part, or is, some, is it a commission? Or well, it, it, it's, it, it, basically the, the person that urged me to become a writer, who was the writer James Morris, said to me, always try and write books if you can, because you can do all the journalism in the world, but the newspapers will inevitably end up lining the bottom of the parrot's cage, <laughs> or you know, fish and chips will be folded into them. Mm. At least a book has some mm. semblance of permanence to it. And so I wrote the first book was about Northern Ireland, where I was for three years at the very beginning of my career. And that book did all right. But then I was sort of seized with all the conceit. I'm, I'm a writer now. Mm. And I w was then transferred to America. And this was 1975. And I thought, well, 1976 is the 200th anniversary of uh, the founding of the Republic, so um, I'll write a book. And I had this conceited, juvenile idea that the essence of America, the quiddity of the country, if you like, was not to be found in the effete East or the decadent West, mm. but to be found in the Midwest. So I took out my car, which was a battered old Volvo, and I spent six months driving up and down, up and down, Interstate 35, which goes from Duluth, Minnesota, to Laredo, Texas, and wrote a book called American Heartbeat, which Faber, who were my publishers in those days, published with politeness, I wouldn't say overextended enthusiasm, and um, it sold 12 copies. <laughs> it did so lamentably. And Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, William... We're, we're that with pride, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I sort of did the fact that William Least Heat Moon, who is a, yes, yes, a Indian, Indian writer, writer, Indian writer, he, well, not actually, but he gave himself that name to advance, he's, he's got a completely different name. Um, he bought another copy about five years ago, so I'm up to 13 <laughs> now. This is like poetry, you see, these <laughs> are poetry <laughs> figures. <laughs> but, so, but the thing is, until 1998, and this mm. book called The Surgeon of Crowthorn, I had written, I think, 10 books, but not one of them had made a nickel. They were mm. all commercial failures. Mm. And I was beginning to think, and this is, I was what? I was born in 44, so in 1998, I was therefore 54 years old, mm. and younger and <clears throat> prettier and more energetic people were sort of taking over the journalistic field from me. Mm. 
and the stories that I used to be sent to, because I used to be the, the chap that went to war and so mm. forth. Other people were doing that, and I was essentially slightly being felt, at least anyway, that I was being somewhat put out to grass, and none of the books were doing well. Mm. So I thought, you know, all the curves are going the wrong way, and what is going to become of me? And but then... Then you had a big hit. Well, then, completely unexpectedly. Perhaps you want to say a little bit about the, the surgeon of Crowthorne? Well, it, was, it, was, it had an amazing beginning, and also a, a series of astonishing events which led to it becoming a success, because there's no getting away from it. It was a tremendous... It sold millions of copies. It right? really did. Yeah. But it, you know, it's a book about 19th century lexicography. Who would, on earth would think that would be at all popular? No, I was, um, I was, had written a book about the Yangtze River. I'd spent a year traveling from Shanghai up four, four and a half thousand miles to a place called Gelandandong in Tibet to write about this river. And the, you know, the book was very politely reviewed and very well reviewed, but it was a success d'esteem only. It just didn't, like all my books, it didn't sell particularly well, which is when I was gripped by this, oh, what's, what, what am I going to do with my life kind of feeling. And then my, but, but the extraordinary thing is that my publishers still had some faith in me. They thought, well, all of your books thus far have been relatively failures, but maybe <laughs> come up with another idea and maybe that one will be a success. And so I had an idea which I still think would work to this day. But, and that was, I loved the idea of, the romantic idea of the tramp steamer, that the shipping culture of the world is essentially dominated by container ships, which are boring, ugly ships. But tramp steamers, you know, which goes from port A to port B, and then discharges its cargo and looks for another cargo and then goes to Port C or maybe back to Port A, sort of gypsy of the sea. Um, I thought what I'd do was to buy a, an 800-ton tramp steamer, about 150 feet long, <laughs> and you could. there were lots of them because they were a dying way of maritime life, and lots of them laid up in the Baltic, and you could pick them up for a song, really. And I would populate it with a crew of people that were sort of caricatures, if you like, of... of the kind of people you get at sea, you know, the dyspeptic, misanthropic radio operator, the bully of a chief engineer, <laughs> the, the wise but perpetually uh, drunken captain, and so on and so forth. And we would run this little ship as a working cargo ship mm. from London to London or New York to New York, all around the world to you know, silted up estuaries and forgotten islands and overlooked ports and write a, a hymn to this fading way of maritime existence. And the publishers said, yeah, go for it. And they gave me a, a reasonable amount of money to go and buy the ship. And um, <laughs> I know, it's, it's, uh, this is back in the heyday, well, not all that long ago, not even 20 years ago. Yeah. And um, then uh, after about four months into the project, when I had identified the ship and had assembled some of the crew anyway, most of the people only wanted to do it in the Caribbean and in the South Pacific. <laughs> I said, well, you've got to sign up for, you know, the Bay of Biscay in November as well. <laughs> they, they didn't much like that idea. But my publisher said, come for lunch, tell me how the project's going. And so I went to lunch with her, a lady called Marion Wood. And what traditionally happens, I think all over the world, after a lunch with your publisher, is that you're taken back to the office and he or she shows you the books that are going to be published that next coming season and take any one you want. And I looked at the shelf of books and I picked one, not at, entirely at random, but it was at one of these moments of great good fortune. It was mm. a book by a man called Jonathan Green called Chasing the Sun, Dictionaries and the Men Who Made Them. And I have, at the time, a little cottage in upstate New York, and I drove up there. This was a Thursday, I think, and I drove up for the weekend. And I was captivated by this book, and I was reading it the following morning mm. in the bath, of all places. Mm. And it was about 7.15 in the morning, and there was a footnote which said, readers of this book specialist book, will of course be familiar with the story of W.C. Minor, the deranged American lunatic murderer who was the principal contributor to the Oxford English Dictionary. Mm. I'd never heard of this, and I sat up like Archimedes in the bath, <laughs> said, you know, what? Is there, I wonder if there's a book. And in this moment of coincident good fortune, I happened to remember the telephone number of the only 
lexicographer in the world that I knew. She was in Oxford, a woman called Elizabeth Knowles, and I had the phone by the bath. I often shuddered to think if I hadn't, and I dialed her number, which I can remember to this day. It's 01144186556767. <laughs> and it didn't answer, and it didn't answer, and it didn't answer. And I was oh. just about to hang up when suddenly, hello, very bad-tempered voice. And I said, Elizabeth. And she said, yes. And I said, this is Simon. And I'm calling, I should first of all confess, if you hear any strange noises, from my bath in America. And I need uh -huh. to know, do you know anything about someone called W.C. Minor? Mm. And she said, well, first I must apologize. I was going to the pub for lunch. It was 12.15 in Oxford. Um, and I heard the phone down the hall and I said, drat. And I ran back and that's why I'm out of breath and bad tempered, but lovely to hear from you. But yes, I probably know more about WC Minor than anyone in the world. Because about 10 years ago, I wrote a monograph assessing his contributions to the OED, which if you'll do me the honor of getting out of your bath and toweling yourself <laughs> dry, stand by your fax machine, I'll send it to you. So, very long story cut short, because there is a coda mm. to this, which I think is worth telling you about. Mm. So it was decided that I would write this book, and it, it didn't seem to me it would take very long. The American publisher wouldn't hear of it, so we cancelled the contract to write the tramping book. I had to pay all that money back. Embarked on a venture. I'd never written a book about history, least of all about lexicography. Mm. But, you know, my books, such as I wrote, were about travel, but they didn't do very well, so let's try something <laughs> else. So I wrote the book. It came out in Britain um, and did reasonably well. And then it was due to be published in America. I was already on, by this t time, to researching another book. And I was up in the far north of Ellesmere Island in northern mm. Canada at about 82 degrees north with a woman from Canberra in Australia we were doing a sledding expedition in the middle of absolutely nowhere, researching the life of a man called Adolphus Washington Greeley, who I thought would be worthy of a, of a book. And in northern Ellesmere Island, you are not allowed to carry a rifle, and that's a problem because there are lots of polar bears, but you must carry a radio. So sudden, one day, it's just endless mm. snow fields, nothing. The radio burbles into life. Is Simon Winchester there? Most peculiar, but yes, hello, Roger, out, whatever you say. And this person said, well, this is not life or death, but are you anywhere near a telephone? And I said, uh, no. And I, but then the woman I was with said, but there's a geological field camp about 50 miles away. If we adjust our course about three degrees to north, we should get there. And they're bound to have a, a sat phone. So I said, all right. And I said to the operator, oh, give me the number. And once again, it's a number I'll always remember, 212-207-7256. <laughs> In New York, a woman called Jane Byrne. So we adjusted our course, went to the field camp. They did have mm. a sat phone. I called this number. I had no idea who this person was. And she said, oh, hello. Thank you for calling. I am your publicist for this new book. I'd never had a publicist because none of my books had warranted any publicity <laughs> at all. And she said, this book is attracting some attention down here in New York. Particularly, the New York Times wants to interview you. And in this mm. trade, if the New York Times says jump, you say, how high? Yeah. So are you anywhere near an airport? And I said, uh, no. But one of the geologists said, but a plane can be brought easily. It'll cost. And I said, a plane can be brought easily, but it'll cost. Forget the cost, get a plane. So two hours later, a de Havilland twin otter comes down with skis, uh -huh. picks me up. I say goodbye mm. to my friend Kate and these very happy geologists now mm. because they've had no female company for quite a long time. And I said, I'll see you in three or four days. So I flew to a place called Resolute and then down to Ottawa and then down to New York. And I met this chap, a fellow called Mel Gusso, who worked for the New York Times. And he was sort of a former theater critic who was now writing a column called At Lunch With, where he had lunch mm. with a, what he thought was an interesting person every week. So we talked for four or five hours, and there was a photographer there, and then I flew back up to Ottawa, to Resolute, joined Kate, and we resumed our expedition. A month later, finished it, she went back to Australia, I came back to, um, to New York, and I rang this woman, Jane, I said, well, what was all that about? She said, he loved the book, he loved you. Even the photographs were nice. I mean, she'd never seen me before, saw the full horror, but said <laughs> the photographer apparently did a reasonable job. 
So the piece, with any luck, will appear on the front of the art section of the New York Times um, on a Monday soon. Well, that was the uh, beginning of May. Every Monday in May went past nothing. Every Monday in June, every Monday in July, every Monday in August. And then at the very end of August, Jane rang and she said, I've got some good news and some bad news. The good news is that the piece about you and this book, which in Britain was called The Surgeon of Crowthorn, but in America it's called The Professor and the Madman, um, will appear on Monday. I've seen it, it's wonderful. It's, four th it's a publicist's dream, 4,000 words, five photographs, mm. everything we want. That's the good news. The bad news is that you as an Englishman may not realize that Monday is Labor Day. And no one in New York reads the New York Times. So. <laughs> but, as it happened, Labor Day 1998 in New York City, it rained all day. And New York has had nothing to do but read the New York Times. Mm. And what they did was they did not go out to their Barnes and Nobleses and their Borderses, but they operated their computers to go for the first ever time to this newfangled site called Amazon.com. Mm. And that night, the professor and the madman was number one on Amazon, and it got onto the New York Times bestseller list and remained there for 53 weeks. So <laughs> when I think of all this, the telephone call and remembering Elizabeth's number and um, answering the, in Ellesmere Island uh, and good luck. Well, it's almost like a fa fairy tale it almost of, of is. writerly life, really, isn't it's it? It's astonishing, um, yeah. I, I guess when I, when I was reading those books, um, Simon, I, I was interested the way they did seem to be a continuation. I mean, I keep coming back, I guess, to the fact that you did work as a field geologist in Uganda, you studied geology, but you were always interested in systems of thought, lexicons, the way hum humanity gathers its information, you know, through, um, I guess, through science, but also you've obviously been fascinated with map making through your life, and obviously the dictionaries, and then after that, um, the, the surgeon of Crowthorn, you went on and wrote um, the meaning of everything, you know, about the um, the, um, the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, I find that I find there's a nice continuity in that because I guess you make it sound a little bit. There obviously was a bit of a road to Damascus in commercial terms, and I guess the success of that book made it possible, I guess, for you to write the books you wanted to write after after that, or what happened? Well, yes, that's e exactly right. I mean, I. I Previously, I had written the books I wanted to write, but no one wanted to read. <laughs> now, these were books that had the happy coincidence mm. of being books I wanted to write, but which also, mm. at least a sufficiently large number of people, seemed to want to read them mm. to uh, allow me to keep writing them, if you like. Although it is a little... Uh, believe you me, this is very much a first-world problem. <laughs> but the publishers now, and I love the publishers dearly, um, really only want me to write bestsellers. And it's mm. not always possible. I mean, mm. it's, and I'm not complaining, but the book I want to do next, for instance, has, on the surface of it, very little commercial appeal. And I would say that The Professor and the Madman, if it, if it was presented as an idea now, they, I'm writing about this American lunatic involved in making the Oxford English Dictionary. You want to write a book about a dictionary in Victorian England? Well, no one will buy that. I think it possibly wouldn't be commissioned these mm. days. And did, didn't Mel Gibson buy the film rights He did, one? and yeah, still so. owns them. <laughs> but because he's offended every Jew in Hollywood, <laughs> there's no chance of him raising the money to make right. it, I think. Well, that's probably almost a relief. I think the book's very happy to sort of carry on residing on the page rather well, than on the big screen. Well, that's uh, a, it's a comfortable way of putting it. I <laughs> wouldn't mind seeing it on the big screen, although I think Bill Bryson, who is a friend of mine, is not terribly pleased that the book about the Appalachian Trail appeared on the big screen because it was a dreadful, dreadful film. Right. So there is the risk that Mel Gibson might make a dreadful, dreadful film. Yeah, that yeah, would, yeah. It would be a shame, yeah. So what about these big, big topics that you've taken on? Because I can see with something like The Surgeon of Crowthorn, to me that's like you're starting off with a, a, very, a, a single person in history, really, but then you do talk about the 19th century in America and England and you know the, the, the beginnings of dictionaries and you bring in all those other bigger things. But I guess with the Atlantic, and particularly with the Pacific, because I was just thinking probably the Pacific is the biggest subject on the planet, unless you write a book about the planet. You know, <laughs> um, the Pacific is huge. It's one third of the, the globe. Um, what, what made you do it? I mean, was it a logical carry-on from the Atlantic book? Or was, was, is there some, it really, is there an emotional kind of driver for this? Or what, what is it? No, except that I had written a book about the Pacific when I lived in Hong Kong. Mm. And that was so bad. I mean, it was badly organized, and it was, it was a very juvenile book. And I sort of wanted to try and get the Pacific right, 
right. to sort of right the wrongs of whenever it was, <laughs> 1989 or whenever I wrote it. Yeah. But no, I think this, this book, I think the, the, the big change was from writing a book, well, the point you make, I absolutely take it. It's looking at the world through the prism of one person, if you like, mm -hmm. so W.C. Minor in the, mm -hmm. in the dictionary book, William Smith in the Map that Changed the World book, the event, Krakatoa, mm. allows you to look into a, a greater world of, well, all sorts of things, but geology. And then, in a way, my, f my favorite book, um, which was in America called The Man Who Loved China, mm. but in Britain was, had a not very good title of Bell, uh, Bomb, Book and Compass, about this remarkable scholar called Joseph Needham. It was the, the change after that, I think, because the next book after that was the book on the Atlantic, mm. in which I sort of quite consciously decided, well, instead of looking at the world through the prism of one story or one person, let's try and do it the other way around and look at one big story and try and reduce that to a number of smaller, more palatable stories. Um, whether it worked or not, I, I'm not certain. I think it, it did give my publishers pause because those books weren't as popular as the ones that involved the single person. Mm. But I, I think I'm, I enjoy writing them so much, I don't know that I'm necessarily going to stop, unless I come across some amazing character, quite mm. serendipitously, who I suddenly want to write a profile of. I mean, there was a chap who I wrote about in the a book called The Men Who United the States, who was... Um, a chap called Clarence King. And he was an amazing person um, on all sorts of levels. He was put in charge, he was a geologist, and he was put in charge at the age of only 27 of what was called the 40th Parallel Survey, which was surveying all of the west of the United States from Sacramento to Cheyenne, which about 1,000 miles, north and south of that line, about 100 miles, so 100,000 miles of territory. And he took seven years to do it with a team of fellow geologists and botanists and it became the most astonishing piece of, of science. I mean, the, the, the books that, that, that describe this survey are absolute classics, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Then he became the first ever head of this newly formed body, the United States Geological Survey, which of course still exists to this day. But then he did something very strange and very fascinating. He went to New York, he's now in his 60s, he's never married, he's fantastically interested in sex, but not with white women. He likes sex with Native American ladies or with black ladies. He goes to New York, working now for a company in what is now Tribeca, and he is walking through Riverside Park one day when he sees a woman of his dreams. It's a real coup de food. <laughs> he looks at her and says, this is the woman I want to settle down with. She's a black lady. She's a lady's maid wheeling a pram or something mm. in Riverside Park. And he goes up to her and what he should have said probably was, good evening, madam. Uh, my name is Clarence King. I'm the former director of the United States Geological Survey. Uh, would you care to have dinner with me? But he, he doesn't. And he says, and goodness knows where he gets the name from, but he says, good evening, madam, my name is James Todd, and although I look white, I am in fact black, and I am a porter with the Pullman Railway Company. <laughs> Will you have dinner with me? And she agrees, they have dinner, they fall in love, they marry, and they have four children. And for the rest of his life, which is another 25 years, he lives two completely separate lives. He has a house in Queens, with Mrs. Todd and the four, what I suppose would be called toddlers. And <laughs> so the cheap joke, but I, I imagine. And he says to her on a particular day, right, well, I'm going off to, for a month, working on the 20th Century Limited or the California Zephyr or one of the great westbound trains. And he leaves her, mm. says, I'll be back in a month, walks over the newly built Brooklyn Bridge to his offices in what is now Tribeca, all these brother geologists say, welcome back from your field trip. Um, <laughs> and he spends a month working in the office as a white man. And then he says, must, I must go back to the field again. Walks back across <laughs> the bridge, assumes the identity of Mr. Mm. Todd, black man, back father of four, and hands his money to his wife and uh, 
He lives this life. It costs him a great deal of money. He has to borrow money from a man called John Hay, who went, went on to become Secretary of State in one of the early, or well, late 20th, 19th century governments. He goes, he's detained for onset of madness outside the lion enclosure in the Central Park Zoo. But he keeps up the pretense until he's about 85 when he falls ill of tuberculosis and goes down to uh, Albuquerque in New Mexico to recuperate, but he doesn't recuperate. And he confesses to his doctor that Mrs. Todd of Queens must be told she's in fact Mrs. King and that her husband was not a, a black man, was in fact a white man, and he apologizes <laughs> deeply and then <laughs> dies. I just think that would make a wonderful story and indeed a wonderful film. Yeah, yes, yes. So, no, I, I think we agree. <laughs> um, let's get back to the book for a minute. I want to get, let's get to, let's get, oh, we need to get to the Pacific. We live in the Pacific. Right. We've invited you down to our, our paradisical you know, life here. Um, um, with this book, can you just tell us a little bit about the structure? I mean, you chose 10 moments or places, epicenters, whatever you'd like to call them, of Pacific history to kind of tell the story, which I guess is one way of putting a few meaningful marks on something that probably is a pretty undoable project to write a history, a portrait, a essay about the whole thing as a whole. Can you tell us a bit about how you went about that and what the priorities were? Well, the first priority was to decide when I wanted to begin the story, and it, mm -hmm. I thought I wa wanted it to be the modern Pacific, so I wanted to take you know, Balboa and Magellan and Cook and Tasman and all these people as, as red, if you like. So begin it at a much more recent date, and I thought of the uh, surrender of the Japanese forces on the Missouri on the 2nd of September 1945, or the founding of the People's Republic of China on the 10th of October 1949, mm -hmm. or in the end, uh, another date seemed beguiling, and that was um, the 1st of January 1950, mm -hmm. and, and it, I could get very boring about exactly why I chose it, but it's all to do with the dating system. Um, you know, now that nowadays we don't favor A, D, and B, C quite as much as we used to, and there's this fudge of B, C, E, which before Common Era, or before Christian Era, and that's not really good enough for the scientific community who tend to use this notation BP, we talk about the Wisconsin Ice Age as mm. having occurred 10,000 years, BP, BP standing for before present. And present, when is it? Well, it's been defined as the index year is the 1st of January 1950 for mm. a pretty boring set of reasons to do with carbon-14 dating. Um, but as most of the pollution thrown up into the atmosphere, which distorts the whole carbon-14 dating thing, came from the nuclear testing in the Pacific Ocean, it seemed to me that January the 1st, 1950, was a good starting point. Before that year, the world was, or the atmosphere was, as it were, pure. And after that, it was impure, and it was rendered impure by the rubbish thrown up into the atmosphere from places like Bikini and Chris Christmas Island and, and Woomera and so forth. So that was the beginning date, and the end date I've chosen was May the 14th, 2014, for a completely different reason. So within those two dates, 64 years, coming up with a list of events that seemed interesting, um, important, if you like, but mostly interesting, events that had happened in and around the Pacific during those 64 years, and then winnow them down from, I got about 300, I suppose, to 200, and then to 50, and then to 12, and then finally mm -hmm. to 10. And whether or not they are well chosen, it's obviously up to the critics. You, you, mm -hmm. you do your best, and you... So I, just to give a rough list of them, it begins with the nuclear testing in the, in particularly Bikini Atoll, and then, and each of these events is, uh, they're in chronological order, so that mm. began in the 19, early 1950s. Mid-1950s was the invention of the first transistor radio by the Sony Corporation. Um, then 1959 was the release of the movie Gidget in the United States, which really made the whole sport of surfing, which mm. is, after all, a Pacific invention. It made it popular. Um, then uh, the, the creation of North Korea and the, um, the whole business of, well, everything that North Korea has done, which makes it such a wretched mm. nuisance. 
um, the sinking of the Queen Elizabeth II, uh, quite the, the Queen Elizabeth, the original, in Hong Kong Harbour in the 1970s, the dismissal of Gough Whitlam as Prime Minister of Australia in the late 70s, the destruction of um, the city of Darwin by Cyclone Tracy, uh, Christmas 1974, if it was, the appearance of coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef in the 1980s, the discovery of um, sea of the ocean f vents in the bottom of the ocean by the Alvin, and so on and so forth. I, 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 there are ten events yeah. all, all told. <laughs> and as I say, whether they're well chosen or not is... I, I, I did my best, and if the critics... I, I think they're wonderfully chosen, well, but I guess but, but there is a subjectivity in the book, because you do place yeah. yourself within the Well, I think the there story. has to be. I and also, um, as I mentioned before, it, it does seem that Simon's been just about everywhere, you know, so you're flying across the Pacific at the very beginning of the book. So, I mean, you do register that subjectivity, which I think, as an author, as, as a, someone who believes in authors, I think... That's what you do, and it's, up, and the, it's the quality of the book can sort of um, well, can no take that somewhere or can fall, you know. But um, the very nice thing was that I I wrote for the Guardian, and then for the Sunday Times, and then back with the Guardian in in Hong Kong, and at the time I worked for the Guardian, my old editor from the Sunday Times, Harold Evans, Harry Evans, moved to New York and started a travel magazine called Condé Nast Traveller, and he rang me one day. I was in. Perth in west of Australia, and I'd just resigned from the Sunday Times, mm. and I'd rejoined The Guardian at about sort of half the salary, because The Guardian, they used to say, was the newspaper that everyone would love to be able to afford to write for, because they pay so badly. <laughs> and Harry rang up just out of the blue, it was one of these moments where one door closes and mm. another door opens, said, Simon, I'm starting this travel magazine, um, would you like to be our eyes and ears in mm. the Pacific? And basically, we've got a lot of money, so anywhere you want to go, you can go. And so I, that, you know, when publishers say they've mm. got a lot of money, that only lasts for a very few years. <laughs> but for a few years, mm. I was able to go more or less mm. anywhere in the Pacific Ocean I wanted to. So. Right. When you write a book like that, is there a, a problem, not a problem, but a, do, do you sort of hit a wall in that, I guess, meteorologists who have spent their life dealing with, you know, the cyclones in Darwin and stuff, you know, um, you know that they might find your, your rendering of it not quite enough for them. And I guess the other thing about your books is they are wonderfully readable. They're not choked with, with, with well, they have some footnotes, but there aren't, there aren't limitless end notes, and there are good glossaries. So I do think the books do, have, um, do carry their own very cohesive scholarship with them. But at the same time, you're writing about geopolitics and you're writing about, you know, about global warming. And so essentially there are some people uh, in, 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 in their kind of um, you know, lead-lined offices dividing their lives to the, these issues. And so is there a problem that they feel that you're going in there and short-circuiting it? There is. It becomes a, 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 it can become a very serious problem. And uh, it classically did with this book I wrote uh, called the map, the map That Changed the World about William Smith and the, mm. and the founding of English geology. Because the chap who, without naming any names, he, who helped me enormously on the book, I mean, the world mm. expert on William Smith, um, was a geologist I knew vaguely in, um, in the north of England. He had actually been doing a PhD when I was at Oxford doing my BA, and a revered figure. And when I first came up with the idea of doing a book about William Smith, everyone said, well, you've got to talk to this chap. And I sent him an email, and he said, absolutely not. You cannot write this book. I am taking early retirement to write the definitive biography of this fellow. So back off, pal, effectively. Mm. And I wrote back as politely as I could and said, well, I'm terribly sorry, but the fact is I've got a contract. I'm obliged to write this book. All I can say is, with great respect, and I knew he had been, he was already 10 years late with writing this book. Mm. He, had just, he, he had never done it. I said, why, why don't you regard what I do as the hors d'oeuvre while the world waits for the main course? And he accepted this argument and was consequently enormously helpful. And I wrote the book, and it came out, and he was unbelievably furious. I mean, he, he, <laughs> he's mentioned very nicely in the end of the book. Well, I have I, to yeah, say. well, you he is. Yes, to him uh, uh, and it's a homage how, to him almost. But he did the most. Yeah. Uh, I mean, and I can understand why he was upset because the publisher mm. that had been waiting for ten years then cancelled his contract and said, "I'm terribly sorry, but there is now a perfectly adequate book about William Smith out there." Mm. So that was dreadful. Um, 
But then a, 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 a sad thing happened. I mean, he was very angry, and I got a telephone call from the Sunday Times, my old newspaper, saying that an academic has accused you of plagiarism. And that, even the word plagiarism, if it's in the same mm. headline as your name, it, it dogs you. And I knew in my heart that I had done no, no mm. such thing. He had been helpful. I had acknowledged his help, and what happened as a consequence was very unfortunate. Um, and I told the reporter essentially what I've said to you now. I mean, I'm mm. obviously in much more detail. But I said, you can compare like for like. I mean, there's no way that I plagiarized anything. I would never do it. I never have done it. And I should think for two weeks I was waiting, chewing my nails to the quick and thinking, is he going to write a story? Is he going to write a story? But then he rang me up and it was a really decent thing of him to do. And he said, look, I've checked it out. There is absolutely no cause for concern. There's no plagiarism. We're not going to write a story. He's justifiably embittered, but mm. that's it. So don't worry, you're in the clear. Whew, that was an amazing moment, I must say. So yes, the, it's a long answer to your question. You do run up against the anger of mm. academics very often in this mm. business. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I can see that happening. But I mean, the thing is, you do that book too is framed in your subjectivity. To me, it is a kind of literary work, which. Um, you know, as well as obviously being a historical work, and so I, I think I think it leaves a lot of room. That book in particular, um, you know, for um, I suppose for for the tome to come along behind it, you know, and um, sort of um, and make the big definitive statement because you're not trying to be definitive. No, in this not in you're the trying, you're, spe you're speculative, curious, perhaps journalistic in the highest sense of the word. Um, you know, you're um, yeah, you're not trying to take the oxygen out of the room. I certainly wouldn't. And, and one of the nice things about that particular book is that geologists would come up to me and say, years later, because in fact, last year, 2015, was the 200th anniversary of the publication of the map. And so that book enjoyed a, mm. a, a revival. I had to go and talk about it all over the world. And geologists would say, it's so nice when our science, you know, we labor away in dusty mm. corners of the world, but you know, you've thrown a spotlight on it, and, and geology has been made to seem cool or popular or interesting. Rock and roll. Rock and roll, exactly, <laughs> right, exactly. Um, hey, next, I'd like to, I'd like to ask um, Simon just to read a, a, just a short extract from the book Pacific. I think uh, because you talk so wonderfully um, about what you do, I'm sure most of the time you talk about these marvellous adventures, but I'd quite like to take us to the page for a minute, because I think um, the book is full of quite beautiful juxtapositions, um, a flow of ideas, again, very much through your rightly sensibility, but there's a piece here about um, American nuclear te testing um, from, from the, the chapter called The Great Thermonuclear Sea. Um, I was wondering, could, could you read that short part, but perhaps tell us a little bit about um, Set the Scene. It's um, an atoll in the Pacific in the, um, you know, circa 1950. Yes, I mean, this was one of the early um, uh, fission bombs before the big hydrogen bombs started being tested, which was in 1954. And the, this series, I think they were called the Crossroads Tests, were relatively small, and they were the first ones ever to be seen by members of the general public, because mm. the early bombs was the, the one at Alamogordo, and then the two bombs used in anger over Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now the press is being invited to see what America could do, and the director was a US naval admiral called Blandy, had an extraordinarily big nose. <laughs> anyway, it's a weird looking fellow, but sort of irrelevant. Um, mm. Aside from being the first atomic bomb detonation ever seen publicly, the Abel shot is now probably best remembered for what it failed to do. And because some of the failures were positive and confirmed what Admiral Blandy had reassured everyone days beforehand, the bomb, he had said, will not start a chain reaction in the water, converting it all to gas and letting the ships on all the oceans drop down to the bottom. It will not blow out the bottom of the sea and let all the water run down the hole. It will not destroy gravity, and it didn't set fire to any of Bikini's palm trees either. But it also didn't do what was hoped for. It didn't seem to stir much agitation among the immense fleet arrayed around the drop zone. It damaged generally only rather small ships that were very close to the explosion center. It failed to sink the USS Nevada. It failed to sink the enormous Japanese battleship Nagato, a fate that many had hoped for since Nagato had been Admiral Yamamoto's flagship during the raid on Pearl Harbor, and her destruction would have been rich in retributive, in retributive symmetry. It also failed to sink the former German pocket battleship, the Prince Eugen, 
which was at the time a commissioned ship of the US Navy, having been claimed as a war prize and brought all the way to Bikini from Wilhelm, Wilhelmshaven by a German-American crew. The bomb also didn't do as much damage to the animals that had been posted onto some of the ships as stand-ins for crewmen. There were goats in gun turrets, rats at the radar screens, pigs on the poop decks, mice by the mainmast, and rodents by the score just about everywhere. Three quarters of them survived for a while, some of the goats chewing away unconcernedly while all hell was breaking out about them. Two celebrated survivors, Pig 311 and Goat 315, remained so healthy for so long that they were brought to Washington, D.C. and put on display at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's the image on the front of the book, isn't it? That, that was the book. That was well, the no, no, no. That's a later one. That's a, I think um, that's uh, Castle Bravo, uh, the really big one, with this uh, dark stain up uh, the side being the entirety of the USS Arizona, being yeah. Arkansas, being lifted up and vaporized. So basically they put all the ships there as guinea pigs, I guess you could say, with animals on them. Um, I mean, I suppose for me it's a great piece of history writing because it is the facts, it's what happened. But to me it also seems to be... I don't know, symbolically so rich, but also so strange, so, I suppose, poetic. And, but, but I, I mean, I love the way the animals became part of that story, um, which somehow gives it a kind of a absurdity, a kind of a... Um, just seems to be a very complicated, um, many-layered meditation on a historical event. Well, I think, uh, in a way, uh, moving a little bit further forward in this whole bikini saga, mm. I talk about Blandy there, but the real villain of the piece was this chap... Um, Alvin Graves, who was a survivor of a nuclear accident at uh, Los Alamos. He was standing in a laboratory. Some of you may have seen the, the movie of Fat Man and Little Boy, in which this scene is dramatized. There are five or so nuclear scientists, and Alvin Graves was one of them, um, watching this experiment called Tickling the Dragon's Tail, where they have two spheres, or hemispheres, rather, of plutonium, and they're putting one on top of the other to try and make a critical mass, but mm. not actually make it, um, because that would be very dangerous. So they have the two hemispheres separated by a screwdriver held vertically by a physicist called Louis Slotin. And you have three or four nuclear scientists standing behind him, beside him, and Alvin Graves standing behind him. And he turns the screwdriver by about five degrees, lowering the upper hemisphere, sufficiently to start a reaction and all the Geiger counters go mad and then everyone in the room notes down the figures and then he returns it to normal to vertical then he says he's going to do it a bit more and turns it to 20 degrees and the two become slightly closer and well, there's more radioactivity in the room and he everyone breathes a sigh of relief as he returns the screwdriver to vertical again and he says this time we're really going to tickle the dragon's tail and I'm going to turn it to 45 degrees thereby lowering the upper hemisphere very very mm. close to the mm. lower one and as he d does so, someone in the room drops a teacup. And this startles him, and he pulls the screwdriver out, and the two hemispheres touch each other, and there's this blue flash of called Cherenkov radiation, and the room is flooded with gamma rays. And all Slotin can do to stop the reaction is to reach over the wall of beryllium bricks that protect him with his hand and brush the upper hemisphere away onto the floor, the, re the reaction stops immediately, tells everyone to stay where they are, and does some quick calculations and says, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. You, pointing to Alvin Graves, will probably die, <laughs> and I will definitely die in nine days. And nine days later, exactly, he dies, a horrible, painful death of radiation poisoning. Mm. Alvin Graves does mm. not die. He's in hospital mm. for a year. Mm suffering all manner of problems, but is eventually cured. And the remarkable thing is that his mind changes. He believes from that moment on that if you're a big enough, strong enough, strong-willed enough man, you can survive radiation. Radiation <laughs> is a trivial thing which will only damage weak, weak people. And this man is put in charge of the biggest of all. I mean, this, this one's called yes, Cas yes, yes. <laughs> Castle Bravo. He's the man that fires this button knowing that the wind has changed direction and is blowing the radiation mm. from this onto an island called Ronjulap. And they see the locals, the, the locals have seen this great firebomb going off in the west, heard the th roar, and then see these flakes of white, 
what they believe is snow. They've never seen snow. They think this must be snow. And they pick it up and they taste it. And they, mm. of course, it's radiation. Yeah. I mean, it's calcined coral from the reef. And uh, they all start to get sick within moments. And the Americans, led by Graves, who should never have set mm. off the bomb in the first place, say, let's regard them as guinea pigs. Let's not go and help mm. them. Let's see what happens to these people. And the strong mm. ones will definitely survive because radiation is not important. That's yeah. a terrible story. I yeah. Mean, I guess. That, yeah, that's in the book. I mean, um, I mean, I guess, I guess, I, I'm, I'm quite drawn to that. I mean, I think you're writing a literature of you, you describe science experiments extremely well, extremely clearly, but also to, to me quite poetically. I mean, that's 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 amazing. But in, but the layers of irony, the darknesses that come through there, and through the book, in some ways, it is quite a dark view of the Pacific. But I mean. Apart from surfing and a, a you know Hawaiian you know waka at the end of the um, at the end of the book, it tends to be quite heavy. But perhaps before we throw the questions open to the, to the public for, for the remaining ten minutes, um, yeah, what well, would you describe yourself as an optimist, a pessimist, and, and perhaps particular because we're in the Pacific, and we need to ask you at least one Pacific question. You know, um, what do you see, and what, what what's the future for it? Well, I, I'm, a, I'm a tremendous optimist, and perhaps not an optimist so far as humankind is concerned. I mean, we will, after all, be extinct relatively soon. I mean, I suppose this is the geological perspective. I always remember giving a talk once to a, a group of ladies who lunch in Kansas City or somewhere like that, talking about the, um, the Yellowstone volcanoes that will sooner mm -hmm. or later erupt again. And once they do, the eruptions will probably, as in history, go on for hundreds of years and they will mm -hmm. completely demolish or cover with ash cities like Seattle and Portland and San Francisco and Calgary and Vancouver, all of the Northwest United States and the West of Canada will be, will be toast, if you like. Mm. And everyone was rather alarmed in the audience, these nice uh, suburban ladies. Uh, but but um, I said, well, no need to worry because we're talking about geological time, so this won't be for 100,000 mm. years or so, by which time we'll all be extinct. And everyone sort of, <laughs> really, <laughs> except for one lady in the front who yeah. clearly had lunched very well indeed and who stood up somewhat unsteadily and mm. waved her program at me and said, what? She said, what? Even Americans will be extinct? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh. But it is, I, I think, so long as we don't make this too anthropocentric, mm. the world will be okay. I mean, I'm a great mm. believer in the Gaia theory and the world as a self-repairing mechanism. And there are reasons, adequate reasons to believe that the oceans, for instance, which are being hammered at the moment, I mean, the rising sea levels, uh, rising temperatures, rising acidity, increasing frequency of mm. storms, there are mechanisms at work even now, particularly around this horribly named creature which was only discovered in the 1980s called Prochlorococcus, which mm. is the most numerous creature on the planet mm. and absorbs carbon dioxide and emits oxygen such that one in five of all the breaths we breathe today are generated by a creature that we didn't know existed until 1989. It loves warm water. The hotter the seas become, the more of them there are, the more oxygen it will emit, the more carbon dioxide they will absorb. And they, perhaps long after we've disappeared, will get the world back into balance again. So in the long term, I'm optimistic for us. I'm, I'm realistic. <laughs> yes, okay, thank you. Okay, now have we got any questions out there for Simon? Uh, we've got a couple of microphones, so if anyone's got a question, pop your hand up and... Um, I can't see, oh, here we've got someone just here. Okay, thank you. You spoke of your next book, and what, uh, your, what can you speak about that? Yes, uh, the next book that I would like to do and my English publisher is keen, and, and, and the Australian publisher is keen. I haven't put it to my New Zealand publisher yet, but uh, the Americans are still a bit uh, concerned. I want to do a book on the history of precision. Precision was a concept invented or dreamed up by five Englishmen in the 1780s, and then Jefferson in Paris got to hear of it, realized why making things precisely could be a huge advantage to an industrializing society. And it sort of took over our lives. I mean, it began the production of clocks and the production of rifles, and then spread to motor cars. And nowadays, of course, it's lasers and computers and satellites and telescopes and things. And I think I'd like to, to, to write the history of precision as an idea and a concept, 
and consider whether we're becoming slaves to precision and whether, in fact, uh, we should give uh, more reverence to craftsmanship and artisanal um, work and that, that our reverence for titanium should be replaced by a respect for bamboo, if you like. So <laughs> that, that's the general thesis of the book. So, w commercial or not, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Excellent. And okay. I think the publishers will come round eventually. Okay, more questions? Oh, someone up there. This might be a facetious question, but... Just, um, just wait for one second, we'll give you a mic. <laughs> <laughs> this, this might be a facetious question, but if we're all going to be extinct in not that long a time... How long have we got, do you think? <laughs> well, uh, my old professor of paleontology at Oxford, a chap called Jim Kennedy, believed, and this is going to be very depressing, I'm afraid, um, we wouldn't last for more than another hundred years. That it'll be nuclear annihilation for us all. We'll, something will happen, it'll trigger it. And um, that's that. I think most realistic views is that it'll be... You know, how long have we been here? Well, 100,000 years, maybe 20 if we're lucky, 1,000 that is, maybe less, 1,000 oh. years. <laughs> I, I don't know, I won't be around to place or take the bets, but uh, not a very long time, not as long as we like no, to think. No, but we're all right. <laughs> oh, we're all right, yes. <laughs> okay, now, any more, more questions? Oh, one down the very front here, um, thank you. Tracy, you <laughs> yeah, a question about the craft of writing. Your, your last three books appear, anyway, to be immense undertakings as far as the, re the research is concerned. I love them all. Um, how do you go about it? Do you have a, a team of, of people that do research for you, or are you reading it all that yourself? I mean, just to read all the books in the bibliography of Pacific alone would have taken me more than a year. <laughs> well, I, I don't have, have anybody else. Um, and I do read, or at least read, the salient parts of all, all the books that are in the, in the bibliography. I, the entire process, I enjoy so much. I mean, the research, I mean, if I'm going to do this book on precision, I've already sort of amassed a great number of books, uh, indeed brought, brought some here. Um, I can't wait to get into it. And the, the year or so of research will be just enormous fun. And I wouldn't dare, I wouldn't wish to give that to anybody else to do. I mean, I, I want to see it. And, and for instance, if I do do the precision book, it means going to places like the Rolls-Royce factory, the Leica factory, um, the, the Japanese. There's a, there's a firm uh, which makes micrometers, sort of the best in the world. There are all the places that have the international standards, you know, the, the unit of time, the, the meter, the kilogram, and so forth. So I want to go and see them. So there's a lot of travel. There's a lot of um, sort of hands-on speaking to people that are interested in this field. It's partly a, a sort of a homage to my late father, if you like, because he was a precision engineer. He made tiny electric motors for guidance systems for torpedoes. Um, so... A lot of reading and a lot of travel, and I wouldn't wish anybody else to do it. And then after that, then there's the, the, the writing itself, which, once again, I like. The only part of it that isn't much fun is the editing, when my brute of an editor in New York starts slashing and burning <laughs> things that I thought were rather nice, but yeah. I, I accept it has to be done. But uh, no, the whole process, I... And I think this is true of many of my colleague non-fiction writers who I, I know of, they much prefer to do it themselves. Those that have teams of researchers, uh, I, I don't know, they don't seem to have as much fun as I do. I think this is the field geologist in you though, this is the, the person going there and being there and, you know, and um, picking up the human nuances, picking, but also gathering the facts, gathering the data, gathering the hard stuff, but also just getting the flavour of things and the sort of taste of things. Yes, but it does uh, lead to this possibility that, and a reasonable criticism that can be made by some academics who have spent their entire lives devoting themselves to, well, mm. let's say Prochlorococcus, for instance. Mm. The nice lady who discovered it, who's in, at MIT, um, 
I describe in three pages something that she has written, scientific papers. I think she's written 50 scientific papers on prochloriococcus and to distill her work mm. of 25 years into three pages of mine is a, is a very cheeky thing to yeah, it's do. It's a bit of a punch in the face. bit of really, a punch in the face. <laughs> but she's actually enormously happy. She says, well, no mm. one before you wrote about it's ever heard of. Them. And now I'm, yes. now I'm famous. Um, true. It's a, it, look, it's a great book to read if you want to learn things. I mean, I learned a heck of a lot through it. I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Now, I want to get in one last question, or maybe it's a suggestion. Um, I know a couple of the journalists that spoke to you about the Pacific book in New Zealand sort of said, how come New Zealand's only mentioned five or six times? In a, in a, in a way, this is a book about the, the centre of gravity is the North, North Pacific, but also, I guess, the perimeters of it, the, the TPP zones, I mean, Japan, Korea, whatever, um, North America. Um, what a, you, can say, you can say, but I'm just going to suggest, though, I think one of your eight remaining books could be the book called The South Seas that would actually deal with um, the Pacific Islands south of the equator, Chile, um, down to Antarctica, the south, southern seas. That would be a great book. I would um, love to and, do And it. the Pacific book has, doesn't preclude it. You've almost sort of, I think you've set it up to... Um, the to Great South the Sea, why not? <laughs> Thank you. I thought a lovely idea. <laughs> OK. Thank um, you. Um, <laughs> Okay, okay, everybody, I think we're on, we're on full time now. So I'd um, just like to mention um, thanks again to everyone for coming. Thank you for the wonderful questions, too, and thanks for being a great audience. Um, Simon's going to be available to sign books out in the foyer straight away. Um, his next Writers' Week event is a panel with Parla Molisa and Coroy Hawkins on Saturday morning. And the next session here in the theatre is the gala showcase fighting talk. So thanks very much for coming. And can we just put our hands together and thank Simon Winchester thank again? Thank you very much. Thank you.